notes on the class web page. Um, when I redo, are we running? Yeah. When we when, I, when we redo the notes, when I redo the notes, I sometimes forget to make them readable to everybody, <laughs> and that results in effectively a broken link. I just fixed it. And um, anyway, I try to look at it. Plus I and H here with a minus I, 
and all together what you get is an I and then a commutator of H to the pi of X e to the minus I H T and um, uh, then you, you notice that you can bring in the e to the I H T and e to the minus I H T they go right through the Hamiltonian so this is e to the is that a pi of X? that's a, a dot up there yes, okay. time derivative so this is then H e to the I H T phi of X e to the minus I H T rest of the commutator and so this is I H phi of X or if you want X and T commutator so this is the differential equation namely phi dot is I H phi so this is this is time to this is the differential equation. And more generally, for any operator, it's um, I, what have I done? I've multiplied, okay, there's, there's that, but one can also write this as I phi dot, then you get a minus sign, and that becomes phi H. So that's another way of writing it. Um, frankly, I think this is a more natural way of writing it. And so let me, when I generalize it, it's uh, A dot of T then is I H commutator A plus any explicit time dependence. So if there's explicit time dependence in the operator, then you add in that partial derivative. Otherwise, it's just this. When you have explicit time dependence, that's almost always that you've treated some part of the problem classically, and you've got to, uh, and you're putting in uh, explicit time dependence because the classical thing evolves with time in a different way from quantum thing. Quantum thing evolves with time by Okay. Um, All right, now let me say something. Uh, that I, in my notes, I left this out, and I just said that this is the equation for things that don't depend on time explicitly. Now let me uh, point out something that's somewhat incidental, but I think is worth underlining nonetheless. Um, okay, let's look at a state at time zero. Field X and T state, in fact, I think I have a different state, phi at time zero. Okay. Now, so these, both of these are T from zero. And this is at time T. Okay. Now, this, you know, this is, of course, since we know how these things evolve in time, e to the i of h t phi of x and zero e to the minus i h t phi zero. And now what this has to be is psi at minus t phi of x and zero phi and minus t. That is to say the field, the mean value of the field at time t in the state at time zero is the same thing as the mean value of the field evaluated at time zero with the state at minus t. In other words, there's a time lag here. If t is positive, the field is ahead of the states by t. And here, again, the field is ahead of the states by t. And since we're dealing with a system in which um, this, uh, everything is time translation invariant, which is to say these terms are explicitly absent. You have uh, this um, has a minus sign here because it's uh, effectively a time derivative of the field. And so now we have a sub t prime 
plus a dagus of minus p prime. Okay, well that's the whole thing. And um, now, what you can see here is that, let's see, I worked this out about a week ago, and um, I'm, Ah, uh, we do the integral over x first. The integral over x gives us a delta together with a 2 pi cube. So this gives us a, a half from here and a half from there is a quarter. Then we have integral d cubed p, d cubed p prime. We only have 2 pi cubed left. And now this gives us delta cubed of p plus p prime, the three vectors, and everything else is just between these two brackets is, or two parentheses is the same. And uh, now we do the integral over p prime, and that just tells us that uh, p prime is minus p. And um, so what we have then is a a quarter integral d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. And now since p prime is minus p and omega p, omega of minus p is the same as omega of p, this is just omega of p squared, so that pops out of the square root. And um, what we have then is minus omega p a sub p minus a dagger sub minus p times a sub minus p minus a dagger now sub p because p prime is minus p and since p prime is minus p this is a plus p squared so that's plus p vector squared plus m squared and then this is over omega p and now we have uh, a sub p plus a dagger sub minus p times a sub minus p plus a dagger sub p. All right. On the other hand, this is omega p squared. And so this is minus omega p. This is plus omega p. And now, now then we have a lot of cancellations. In the, but just to make it easier, I'm going to repeat and then rewrite what we've got and then we'll see how things happen. Can somebody um, rotate this? Oh, you did. Sorry. Yeah. All right. So this H then is a quarter dqp over 2 pi q omega p and now just multiplying it out, we have a sub p, a sub minus p, plus a dagger sub minus p, a dagger sub p, plus a dagger sub minus p, a sub minus p, plus a sub p, a dagger sub p. Or a sub p, a sub minus p, with a minus sign, minus a dagger sub minus p, Dagus of p plus a dagus of minus p, a sub minus p plus a sub p, a dagger sub p. All right, so this is what we've got. Now we see we've got some cancellations. This cancels back. Um, this one cancels this one. And now um, this is a function just of p squared. Function of p squared, and so we can reflect something that's minus p minus p into p p, and then we add it to this. We add this one to that, and um, so what we get then is a factor of two. So then we get minus, then we get one half p q p two pi q omega p, a dagger sub p, a sub p, plus 
cases be antagonistic? Why just combine these two? Combine these two and these two. You get the factor of two. Now, we can write this. This term here is equal to a dagger sub P, A sub P, plus A sub P, A dagger sub P commutator. This term combines with this, gives us another factor of two, and so we get integral D cubed P over two pi cubed. Let me switch back to E sub P, which is the same as omega P. As I said, I don't know why I've been using omega P. When I was a graduate student, Sidney Coleman used omega P all the time. It was a lot of neurologically conditioned to that. Anyway, A dagger P, A sub P. Okay, so this is the part that we're all happy with. And then what we've got is this. And what is that? Well, that is plus one half two pi cubed delta cubed of zero. So this is infinity because it's a delta function, and then also infinity because you're integrating over all of space, all of all energies. This part of the delta function one can sort of finesse because if we did quantization in a box, this wouldn't be, this would be a chronic of delta. And so this would just give a factor of the volume of the box. But this part, D cubed P, E P, this is serious. This is infinity to the fourth power. This is bad news, and it's a reason why I think physicists should be very embarrassed for the last 70 years or so. Well, it's 80 years now. We've had this problem for something like more than 80 years. The solution to it, people thought maybe supersymmetry would be a solution because in supersymmetry theory, you pair every Bose field with Fermi field, and when we go through this for the Dirac field, we'll see we get a minus sign here. And so with supersymmetry, you can cancel this term. That may be somehow related to the answer. The fundamental problem, though, is probably that it's just crazy to talk about point particles at all. We're effectively talking about point particles when we do quantum field theory. And the particles can't be points. And so one has to do a theory of extended objects, and string theory is one attempt to do that. In fact, in string theory, these infinities do go away, and so that's obviously a good thing. Whether string theory is right or not, or even whether it's what it is, is still a theory of flux. Okay, in any event, so what one does is, for practical purposes in most calculations, one can just, well, the practice, let me just say what the practice is in quantum field theory, you just ignore it. Heskin and Schroeder make the statement that's a little crazy. They say, well, it doesn't matter because it always cancels. Well, it doesn't always cancel in the Casimir effect. For example, if you have big conducting plates, then modes of the electromagnetic field between the two plates have to essentially have E parallel, parallel meaning that way. E parallel has to be zero here and zero on the other plate. So there are a whole, there are an infinite number of modes here. I am, I'm teaching, can we talk at about quarter seven? 
Costco closed at 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> she has an iPhone. All right, anyway. Um, I'm her aunt. All right, anyway, human aunt. Okay, so back to the Casimir effect. Conducting plates, and so you expect then that the, um, the electromagnetic field inside has to have nodes here, but outside the field can, well, outside they have to have nodes here, but they can do anything that they go out. And um, so what you have then is you have less of an energy density inside than you do outside, and that forces the plate together. This has been observed, and um, it appears, as I said, I haven't examined these things in detail, but the rumor is that the uh, uh, calculations are consistent with the theory. Um, notice, however, that you have a natural cutoff here. The natural cutoff is that the conductivity in this uh, conductor is really good as long as the frequency isn't too high. When you're talking about photons that are um, you know, a gazillion GeV, well, they, go, they don't even see that metal plate they just go right through. So you have a natural cutoff in the gazillion GeV and the ultraviolet end of, the, of this integral, uh, the energy density cancels on both sides. And, um, okay, so long digression there. But um, apart from the Casimir effect, then one just basically ignores this, and um, uh, it's just one of many infinities that occur, and there's a procedure called renormalization, which is a systematic way of, um, of uh, segregating the infinities that are due to fact that the particle is being treated as a point away from the other the long distance uh, effects and um, that that works and the reason it works is that if, I mean, in, in other words, imagine that the particles really are extended objects but very small but the scale at which, the scale of the extension is much smaller than any energies that we can make, uh, access in Accelerators, uh, say the LHC, and, uh, then um, uh, what you can say is that the that the uh, that these infinities. Well, the, first of all, the finite extension cures the infinity, but on the other hand, it doesn't get away of anything you do in the calculation. So you should be able to renormalize it away. So our, our Hamiltonian then is of the following form. It's an integral to QP over 2 pi Q, uh, E sub P, A gamma sub P, A sub P. And the result is that um, uh, the Hamiltonian on the commutator of the Hamiltonian with A sub P is then E sub P, a dagger sub P, and uh, the Hamiltonian with A sub P commutator is minus E sub P, A sub P. And so this means that the Hamiltonian on A sub P dagger vacuum, this makes the particle momentum P out of the vacuum, this gives us E sub P, a dagger P vacuum. Was there a question? Yeah. How, so how is the Kashmir effect different than what we're doing? Oh, well, if we had been quantizing the electromagnetic field, uh -huh. um, and then we had gotten this expression here, and then applied it to the two conducting plates, we would have seen that the energy density, that this term was different in here from the way it is out there. Right. And um, we would have had that high energy cutoff, and um, we could have calculated what the 
the difference in energy density was, and then we get the force that pushes the plates together. But, we're, but, but that's a sort of sophisticated calculation. We're not going to be doing that now. Yeah, uh, hold on. I have to give a candy. <laughs> Okay. In fact, you don't need to view yours in advance. Oh, when you go to the second round, wouldn't you get just one hat on time? This turn? Yes. Wouldn't you get just one hat on the I don't see how they can tell you. Well, here, um, what I'm saying here is this turn, A sub P, a dagger of Q, is. 2 pi cubed delta Q of P minus Q. That's, and, um, that's what we're using. Let me just, yes, it's, that's the Hessian Schroeder normalization. So, so using that, that gives 2 pi cubed delta of 0, and then there was a 1 half over here. And then there was this, is that. So I think this is right. So when you iterate, don't you get finite? So No, when you, when you, this is delta of, of, um, this delta of zero is just basically infinity, or equivalently, if you do box quantization, it's the volume of the box. You still have to integrate over p. This was delta of p minus p. So you integrate over p, and this is, you know, this is like, this is the integral zero to infinity, four pi p squared dp, square root of p squared plus m squared. That's what this thing is. That's why I say it's infinity to the four. Where is it? Am I answering your question, or did I miss it?
say a couple of things about the Lawrence Group. What is the Lawrence Group? The well, Lawrence Group is such that if you say x prime is Lx, I'm using L as a 4 by 4 matrix, and x is a 4 vector, and y prime is Ly, then there's this Minkowski inner product, uh, which is sometimes written as just x prime y, which could be written as x prime transpose eta y prime. Here, eta is 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 in the, with zeros everywhere else. This is the Peston Schroeder metric. Finley uses minus that, as does Weinberg, as I think Schrodinger. In any event, this thing, x prime transpose, is Lx transpose eta Ly. And of course, what I forgot to say is that the whole point of Lorentz transformation is that it keeps in, it keeps this Minkowski product here invariant. In other words, x prime y prime is the same as xy, where in both cases, uh, where, where xy is x transpose eta y, and x prime y prime is x prime transpose eta y. And so in other words, this is equal to um, x0 y0 minus x dot y. And this is equal to x prime 0 y prime 0 minus x prime dot y. Or dot is just 3 right. So this is the Lorentz group. Now, since x and y are arbitrary, what that tells us is, and since we can rewrite this as x transpose L transpose eta L y, we have that equal to that. Since x and y are arbitrary, that gives us the relation L transpose L, L transpose eta L equals eta. So this is the definition of of a Lorentz transformation. This is what a 4 by 4 matrix has to be to be a Lorentz transformation. And, um, well, you know, the determinant of a trans of the transpose of the matrix is the same thing as the determinant of the matrix. The determinant of a product of matrices is the same thing as the product of the determinants of the matrix. So all this tells us is determinant of L squared equals 1. And so that means that uh, L has an inverse. And but from the point of view, of, from, from what I'm trying to get at right now, it's that uh, we can call this group SO31, where S means the determinant of L is uh, 1. Now, this just says determinant of L is plus or minus 1, but uh, that divides the Lorentz group into two subgroups. The proper subgroup, which has determinant of L equal to 1, and I guess the improper subgroup, which has determined the value of the minus one. And um, actually, this proper subgroup is, can be further divided into the, into the uh, orthochronous Lorentz transformations, which don't reflect, which prefer, pre preserve the sign of the time component of time-like vectors. And the non orthochronous which flip the sign of the time component of time line vectors. So there are four different Lorentz groups. And basically, you've got the PO subgroup, which is proper and orthochronous, that is to say, determined L equals 1 and doesn't screw around with time. And then you go from that to the rest of the Lorentz group by using P and T and PT, where P reflects. Space and is parity, T reflects time, 
time reversal, and PT, which I spoke of. So that's our Lawrence group. But the point here, incidentally, this expression, this is almost irrelevant for now, but we can rewrite this as eta squared, which of course is the 4 by 4 identity matrix. So that tells us that L inverse is L transpose, wait a minute, L inverse is L, did I do this? I think I did this backwards. Yeah, I want to multiply from the left by eta. So L inverse is eta L transpose eta. So that's our formula for the inverse. I'm not going to be using that now, but this is what I mentioned. In any event, since the Lawrence transformation, and in particular the proper apartments ones, or at least the proper ones, has determinant L equals 1, it follows that the Jacobian, which is the determinant of the partial derivatives of X prime with respect to X, where here X prime is LX, that this thing is equal to 1. And so what that means is that D fourth X, D fourth P, these are Lawrence invariant structures. Another Lawrence invariant structure is anything made from P squared, where P squared in the Hessen-Schroeder metric is P squared minus P vector squared. That's Lawrence invariant. And if we're talking of proper orthogonalness, then theta of P0, theta of P0 is Lawrence invariant if P squared, if P is time-like, and so one can, so the thing, sorry, so let me rewrite something that is manifestly Lawrence invariant, delta fourth P, delta of P squared minus M squared, theta of P0. So this is invariant under the proper orthogonalness Lawrence. This is a step function? Yes. Theta is the heavy side function, has one side heavier than the other, and in particular theta of X is X plus absolute value of X over two absolute value of X. So that's the definition. And then you say, what is it at zero? And you say that. That's a matter of convention, but whenever you're using a theta function, it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference if you need to be more careful. Okay. All right. Any, let's see, do you need a chalk? Really? Yeah. You sure? Sure. Okay. So that's Lawrence invariant, and let me just remind you something about delta functions. By the way, delta functions are our friends. They're the best thing for a physics graduate to do is delta functions. You should be very grateful to their work. Okay. Okay, so what is this going to be? Well, I say one here, assuming that there's only one root of G. Well, actually, the way I write it this way, there can be only one root, because when it's integrating DG, so that goes from minus many plus infinity, so it's going to hit zero only once. So that is one. And then, but what can we say over here? We can say, well, this is delta of G of X, G prime of X, GX. Sorry, I don't see that. Why would it only hit zero once? Just call it G of X, Y. Yeah. Okay. But. You get a chance. Do you have a bad question? No. It's a good question. I'm sure there was three or four other students who didn't know the answer or were puzzled. 
Anyway, the point of this course is to learn it. That's the point. Okay, well, taking a cue from, I was writing that as delta of x minus x zero. Let me call it y minus y is y zero. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And these things are all the same. And so what that tells us then is that delta of g of x is delta of x minus x zero divided by the absolute value of g prime at x zero. Here where x zero is the root, in other words, g of x zero is zero. And now, in fact, let me see. If we're integrating over g, then we've just got a one here. But if we're integrating over x, then this, in other words, once we transform to this integration, then there could be a variety of places where this is zero. And when we look at it over here, we see these things are all positive quantities. That's why there's an absolute value here. And now we put a sum over the roots of g zero. Anyway, in practical cases, in almost every physics problem, there is either only one root or there are two roots that are obvious on opposite sides of some integration. Anyway, this thing is Lorentz invariant. And in particular, then, if we do the dp zero integration, we have dqt dp zero. And then this is delta of p zero squared minus p squared minus m squared theta of p zero. And now, because of the theta, we only pick up one of the zeros of this. And because the derivative, this is g of x. In other words, g of p here is p zero squared minus, actually, minus e p squared. The g prime is 2 p zero. And so this is equal to dqp when we do this integration. dqp dp zero over 2 p zero delta of p zero minus e p theta of p zero. e p is positive, so we can ignore this. And so this gives us, in other words, if we imagine integrating this thing a little bit, what we're left with is dqp over 2 p zero absorbing these. So in other words, this thing is also Lorentz invariant. So this is what's called manifestly Lorentz invariant. This, in fact, is Lorentz invariant. And this is the Lorentz invariant that this is used all the time in the sort of physics calculations in which such things are relevant. By the way, the fact that this is Lorentz invariant means that if you have something like this, p zero delta q of p minus p prime, that's also Lorentz invariant. It's essentially the inverse of that. So these things are all Lorentz invariant. Peston and Schrode use a different approach to this issue, and it's perfectly valid. I just thought that you ought to see both. You can read the Peston and Schrode, and then you'll see this. Does anybody, do I owe anybody a trouble? I suppose these will last me a Halloween. Chocolate's not too bad for you. It's supposed to be something in it that's good for us. Whether that comes to 
exclusively from research supported by the chocolate industry. <laughs> doesn't mean it's wrong. What? That doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So, um, what we're going to do, what Hessian and Schroeder do, is they say the state of uh, one particle is two e, square root of two e sub p, a dagger sub p on the vacuum. And this is their equation, 2.35. Zero. All right. And we also have this commutator, just to remind ourselves that this is 2 pi Q delta Q minus Q three vectors R. So what is the inner product of two states? Say P on the left, Q on the right. Well, it's going to be 2 E P, 2 E Q, and the square root 0, uh, A of P, A dagger Q, 0, and this we can replace this by the commutator because A of P annihilates the vacuum and A dagger annihilates the vacuum from the other side. And so this gives us 2 pi cubed, 2 E of P, delta Q, P minus Q. Okay, so that's the inner product, P Q is that. Now what we see is that this expression over here is Lorentz invariant. And so that's the reason why this normalization convention is a nice one, namely it gives you an inner product of states that's more insecure. Now, um, this Lorentz group, of course, is non-compact. And since it's non-compact, it cannot have finite dimensional unitary representations. However, it can have infinite dimensional unitary transformations. And that's what we take advantage of in um, field theory often we'll be saying that U of L is a unitary operator, so U dagger of L is the identity operator. But this is an infinite dimensional thing. It maps, for example, this is a this effectively does a Lorentz boost. And so it takes P into the lambda P. Yeah. So this, uh, the expression over here is Lorentz invariant because you started with the Lorentz invariant expression? Right. That's the only reason. Yes. So but I mean, you could you could start you know, by looking at this and say, well, how does this transform if you see it? So in, general, uh, in general, what kind of calculations preserve Lorentz invariant? I mean, what can you do to break the Lorentz invariant? That is, in a sequence of Oh gosh, I don't know quite how to answer that question. Um, things that are Lorentz invariant are the things that are, you know, the, inner, the, the Minkowski inner product of two four vectors is your archetypical Lorentz invariant thing. And um, uh, that's one. The other is something that's d fourth p because the determinant of Lorentz transformation as a form of four by four matrix is one. Um, so those two things lead you to certain things that are Lorentz invariant, and everything else is, well, I should say everything else is, is not. Well, I mean, let's put it this way. You, you, you wind up with, I mean, the normal convention is you have these upper and lower indices, and if you have some structure in which the uh, upper and lower, in the, you, you sum over repeated upper and lower indices, for example, F mu nu, F mu nu, where this is Maxwell, at least E or P, e, then this is Lorentz invariant. And it's Lorentz invariant because this thing transforms like two four vectors. This like two ball like this, and the fact that so those two indices are often cool down means you suck in a couple of betas. It's effectively ridiculous. But um, anyway, there are certain 
things the law is conveying and the resilience of things that are. There are infinitely many more things that are not going to be just as there are more irrational ones than rational ones. Okay, so meanwhile, oh, you, 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 you're entitled to short opinion. Okay, so now we want to use these um, two uh, equations. Uh, time will pass at 629. Page, page 17. My notes would go to page 37. Um, so, so let's now look at this. What is U of L on P? Well, we've seen that it's U of L on the square root of 2 ET, the diagonal of P on vacuum, and um, this is then U of L square root of 2 ET, a diagonal P, the diagonal of U of L. Square root of 2 e sub LP 
a dagger to help me. By the way, I I must say that um, somehow I've had a uh, neural screw up here. In the notes, I'm sometimes you, I use the capital Greek lambda here. So maybe we should. Um, in my notes, capital Greek lambda is capital Roman L. There, there are two standard notations for a Lorentz matrix, capital lambda, capital L. Um, I'm trying to stick with L because we're not Greek, most of us. Um, but somehow this is not him. Okay, now, what we expect is the U of L on the vacuum is just the vacuum. That is to say, the vacuum is invariant on the essentially everything. This line above is still operating on the vacuum, or is it? Jesus Christ, thank you. I, just, I got so obsessed with the lambda that, um... All right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, while we... Let's just look at this then. Um, U of L, apart from the... We have U of L, A, Daga, um... So one more question. Because on the line before we had we have the boost acting on the, the vacuum state, but because there's nothing there, we just assume that that doesn't do anything. Right? We have a UL on zero. UL on zero so is just the vacuum. Okay. And I could stick in U oh, dagger okay. U because it's the identity. Yeah. Okay. And so now if we look at this thing. So I'm waving my hand a little bit here. This isn't quite a rigorous proof. But uh, what we've got is U of, U of L, looking at this equation, square 2 ET, a dagger of P, U dagger or U inverse of L. I want to say that this is equal to square 2 E sub LP, a dagger of LP. This is the equation I wanted to get to, which we can rewrite as U of L, a dagger sub P. This is the U inverse L equals, and it'll be the twos cancel, square root E L P over P, a dagger of L P. Okay, so this is the equation I want to get to, and this is um, 2.38 of uh, S control. So I, what you see is I'm filling in some some steps. They sometimes we got some steps. What I'm also going to try to do is give um, Weinberg's point of view, which is um, to say, how do the particles transform on the Lorentz transformation? And that tells us how the field is transformed. Okay, anyway, go back to, so going back to Peston and Schroeder, the one particle part of the identity operator is DQP with this normalization, P pi cubed, P. 1 over 2 e sub p p. Now you see this is a very nicely Lorentz invariant structure, at least this part is, and the pp we've seen is. And so that on the state q gives us an integral dqp over 2 pi q 2 ep uh, p pq and we said that PQ is uh, 2 pi Q, 2 EP, delta function. And so that cancels those two, and that just gives uh, Q. So indeed, this does behave as a proper identity of the graph. Now, um, let's get back to P and S is, um, let's see, P 
convention, therefore, and this is getting back to something that I said at the end of the hour in response to somebody's question. So we'll do it again. This program on time is zero. PQP two pi Q squared of two E sub P A sub P E D I P dot X plus the tag of P minus I P dot X. Okay, what happens when this hits the vacuum phi of X on the vacuum? Well, the annihilation operators annihilate the vacuum, and so we get PQP two pi Q squared of two E P A dag of P minus I P dot X vacuum. And keeping track of the normalization, that gives us PQP two pi Q two E P E to the minus I P dot X the state P. That's because A dag of, excuse me, A dag of on P is P over that root. And so that square root just promotes that to that level. You can see that apart from the E P, this is effectively the non-relativistic expression for something that is the position eigenstate. Okay, so I'm putting like here, the way so many teenagers use the term like, so I'm using it. We're all going to be speaking to Obish eventually. Let's now look at vacuum phi of X the state P. So in other words, what does this do? This is to say that phi of X on the vacuum, apart from the E P, is the non-relativistic position eigenstate. But then just think about this. This thing here is square root of P vector squared plus M squared. So when P is non-relativistic, this thing is just a constant. So this is effectively, it's effectively the position eigenstate over M. It's like that. Now, so what is this? This thing then is vacuum integral DQ P prime 2 pi cubed 1 over square root of 2 E P prime A P prime E to the I P prime dot X. That's a prime, sorry. Plus a dagger P prime E to the minus I P prime dot X. And this is all three vector, and this is P. We're still in the Schrodinger picture. Okay, since we have a vacuum over here, the creation operator would make a two-particle state. That's orthogonal to the vacuum, so that gives zero. We just have then A of P prime on P. Well, I'm not even going to keep track of the normalization. This is proportional to E to the I P dot X, which is like the inner product of X with P. So this is like this non-relativistic object. So non-relativistically, all of this kind of makes sense. All right. Now, I was about to start something completely different that's important, but I'll defer that to Wednesday. What I want to say now is something that might help you if you want to get started on problem two. And I want to do this in class because I think this is very, very important. It turns out it's something that was discovered by Murray Gell-Mann a long time ago when he was young. Let's see. I'm just 
some extent. Well, let me, let me first of all jump ahead. This is the field in the Schrodinger picture. How do things evolve with time? Well, the way they evolve with time can be obtained by figuring out how the annihilation creation operators commute with the Hamiltonian. Well, you know about the harmonic oscillator. You know they're going to go as e to the plus or minus i e sub p t. So with that in mind, this is what the field then is. The relativistic field is d q p q prime q, or I mean, the, I shouldn't say relativistic. This is Heisenberg. I once met Heisenberg, actually, a while ago, when I was young. 1 over the square root of 2 e to the a to the b. And now, whereas we had e to the plus because of the screwy metric that p and s use, this is e to the minus i of px plus a dagger p e to the i of px. OK, so this is the Heisenberg field. And now this is the Minkowski in a product. So this is p0, x0 minus all right, now, suppose you had two fields that had the same mass. Notice the mass has snuck in here because P0 is, the, is, the, is E sub P, which is the square root of P squared plus M squared. So suppose you had two fields, phi 1, phi 2, which is be the same, EP would be the same, so we'd have to be dqp, 2 pi q, 1 over the square root of 2 pp, but now this would, this is a1, and this is a2p, but we use the same px. OK? Now, suppose we want to put them together. Well, we can say phi of x now is phi 1 of x. And usually you put in a square root of 2, but I'm going to leave out the square root of 2 to make things simple. Put it in yourself. This then, if they have the same mass, is integral dqp, 2 pi q, 1 over the square root of 2 ep. And now we have a1p plus i a2p. And because they have the same mass, we can multiply them by the same wave function. And then over here we have a1p dagger plus i a2p dagger e i. OK. Now, this is really easy. I mean, so very simple. We just say a is our new complex annihilation operator, which is a1, so ap now is a1p plus i a2p. Okay. Now what is ap dagger? So ap dagger is a1p dagger minus i a2p dagger. So this thing isn't a dagger. It's a bar dagger. It's an antiparticle. So we define a bar p as a 1p minus i a 2p. And then a bar p dagger is a 1p dagger plus i a 2p dagger. So this is how antiparticles get in. So in other words, this is then integral dqp 